Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dorothy May Mercer, and I'm coming to you for Talk Story TV. Today we have a wonderful author with us who's going to tell us a little bit about her background, and she's going to speak about her book as well. Her name is Kelvin Noel, and she hails from North America, so maybe she'd like to tell us a little bit more about where she's from and what she's been up to. Hi, Kelvin. Welcome to the show. Hi. How are you, Dorothy? Thanks for having me. You're very welcome, and I'm fine. Thank you. Um, so I am um, from Canada. I was born in New Brunswick, which is on the east coast of Canada, and I moved to Toronto. And I moved here. Toronto is very close to New York and Michigan. And I moved here when I was 19. And I've lived here for about 13 years now. How exciting. I've been to New Brunswick. That's really out in the boondock. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> So tell us more about it. Toronto is such an exciting city. It is. Um, for me, growing up in the country, it was, it was great. It was beautiful to live there as a child. You can run around and do what you want to do, and the town is very small. Everybody knows everybody. But, you know, after a few years, it gets a little boring, and you set your sights higher. And that's what happened for me. We came to Toronto when I was eight years old for a visit, and as soon as I got here and I saw the city and I saw all the different types of people, I knew I had to live here. And so I always said that as soon as I get out of high school, I will be moving to Toronto, and I did. So. Yeah. Well, Toronto is very cosmopolitan. You it really is. So many languages just walking mm -hmm. around. It's very multicultural here. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> very, very up-to-date city and very modern and thriving and it's a great place for an author to live. So tell us some of really what you do. Um, well, by trade, I write grant proposals, which is basically asking for money for nonprofit organizations, um, which takes a lot of time. So these are basically 50-page proposals of boring technical writing, but that's what I do as a living. Um, I also edit freelance, and I do online editing. So if somebody has a website or a blog or anything that's on online media that they need edited, I do that. So I edit content. You know, there probably will be a lot of authors watching this, and most of them need editors. So before yes. we're through, you must be sure and tell us how they can reach you online. Absolutely, yes. Um, I do have a blog. It's Kelvian at blogspot.com or .blogspot.com, and I also have a website that is kelvian.com. Um, my email, yeah, kelvian, so my name, .com. And my contact information is on there, and I'm really easy to get a hold of. I'm everywhere. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on pretty much anything. <laughs> so, You're all over. That's yeah, it's very easy. If you type Kelby and Noel into Google, you'll all come up everywhere. So it'll be easy to find me. Yeah. So what made you decide to get into this business? Um, when I was little, I loved to read. I used to go, we lived, like I said, in the country, and we, behind our house, had a cow pasture. And as cliche as it sounds, I used to go back there in the summer, and there was this big, huge oak tree, and I would sit underneath it and read books. And I used to read Ellen Montgomery. I loved Ellen Montgomery. And Janet Oak, which is a, she's a Christian author. And my mom used to sell books for World Vision, or, yeah, for World Vision, I believe it is or I can't remember the name of it now, World Book. I don't know if you remember World Book from the 80s, but my mom used to sell books for them, and she had, like, boxes and boxes of books, so I would read them. <laughs> and um, the thing with me is, when I read them, I noticed that the characters in the books, they weren't like me. They didn't look like me. They weren't the same background. And while I loved the stories, that was kind of something that was disappointing. And so at that time, I said to myself, you know what, I should start writing stories. It would be really cool if I wrote these. And so I went and got my little writing folder that they used to give us in elementary school. It was this big blue plastic fold-out folder. <laughs> and I had sheets of loose leaf and a red pen, and I would sit under that same tree and just write stories. And I still have those stories. And that's how I started. And I remember saying to myself that I was going to be the first young author, the youngest author in history. But then, you know, I was a kid, and I got a little bit busy with kid things. So it didn't really happen for decades later. And um, I went to school for writing. I studied professional writing at university, and I did grant writing for graduate studies. 
And then later on, I just started writing again as a hobby and realized that I missed it so much. And I just, I had joined the same crit group that I was telling you about earlier as a group of women that come together and give each other critical feedback. And because of them, I found that I could do it a lot better. You know, I mean, in the beginning, my writing was, uh, <laughs> if you could read what I wrote early on, maybe two years ago, it was not readable. But now things change, so. <laughs> That's wonderful. And yeah. how did you get into the business of it so that you could earn a living doing this? Um, well, with writing, it's definitely not easy to get into the business of writing. I mean, there are a lot of writers up there. There are a lot of people who want to do it. And for me, I think making a living at it is because I have a lot of people that I know in the city, in Toronto, through my sisters and my brothers, through people from school, and we just kind of have this network. And so because I'm part of that network, if somebody needs something, they'll call on me, or I can recommend somebody else that I know. So that's kind of how I make a living. I'm known. Um, as far as making a living as an author writing fiction, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but I'm on my way. That is my plan. Someday. Not too many people do that, but I'm no. feeling you're one that's going to make it. Oh, but thank you. I hope so. Writing, writing grants, if you were successful at it, seems like that ought to be a way to make some thin money anyway. Oh, oh yes. It's definitely a good way to make money. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's a good way to make money because it's so much work. You know, it's kind of a, a directory like any job. You've got to support yourself doing something so that you can have fun writing novels. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Never quit your day job. Never. <laughs> well, I write novels too, but I didn't start until I was retired from all the other stuff I was doing. And, and, and I had made, made enough money that I could retire from the other things and, and write novels for fun. And it would be great if I could become a famous fiction writer. So uh, any time that happens, I'm ready. <laughs> but uh, I've had a little success, but as far as being able to support yourself at it, you'd have to be really, really famous. Yeah, you would be, yeah. Um, you know, these millionaires, I've, I've heard, I read somewhere where Nora Roberts uh, was a millionaire several times over, and... The only reason is because she's got so darn many books. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's the thing. I think that's the key that most writers need to realize, too, that it's not so much about that one hit and wonder kind of thing. It doesn't really happen that way anymore. You know, you can't write one book. It's a bestseller. You make all kinds of money, and then you never have to worry again. These days, people want to see consistency. So you write a good book, you write another good book, and then you write ten more. And that's how you become famous. Even with, um, I know you must have heard of Amanda Hawking. Even with her, she is a self-published author who made it on her own. And she did it because she wrote so quickly, and she published so many books in such a short period of time. And people just kept reading her books, and they knew that she was, she was consistent. They could count on her to bring something else out. And she's made a lot of money, and she's done very well for herself. Does she write to a certain niche? Um, yeah, well, she is a young, I, guess I would say young adult, urban fantasy, kind of that speculative fiction, which is the same genre that I write, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't want to write young adult fiction, I'm, yeah. but I can imagine that it would be a very good niche if you could get started there. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you, I understand that you've written a book. Do you want to talk about your book? I do, yes. <laughs> um, I wrote a novel uh, about a year ago I started it. It's called Elemental. And it's loosely based on, well, the first book in the series is loosely based on my experience growing up. Um, I grew up in a very religious home. My dad was a minister. And uh, I grew up also in a very small rural town, and we were the only black family in that town. So things were very awkward. I had friends and everything, but it was still quite awkward to be, you know, the only black family in a huge radius, and often the only black, well, all, always the only black child in my class, and often the only black students in the school. So um, 
I decided that I was going to write a story based on that. Uh, but I wanted it to be a little bit more interesting than the book I have a daughter. And so my character, her name is Baltimore, she is, her parents are Wiccan practitioners. And they live in Utah, which would be awkward. And um, yeah. Baltimore is biracial. Her mother is Navajo and her father is black. And so growing up for her, in well, she didn't grow up there, but living here in this town is very awkward for her because people not only look at her as this person who is from a completely different race than most people, but also her parents are witches. And whose parents are witches? You know, I mean, that's difficult. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the story is about her learning how to accept who she is, and it comes with some special advantages. So... That's amazing. What, was your father a black preacher in a in a white congregation? In a white, yes, in a white country town. My father was a black preacher, which was, I mean, what are the chances? <laughs> I'm sure that that's not something people see very often. Dad, God. <laughs> and you know what? Though? I've always thought about writing a story about growing up that way. I just didn't know how to do it. I think this was a way to do it without being so obvious about it. So it's, that's why I say it's loosely based on my experience, because there are some things that she has to deal with that most people have never had to deal with. So, Well, to be um, in Utah and to be part Indian and part black, yeah, she didn't fit anywhere. Not at all. And then to top it off, her parents are witches, so it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. You don't look like that. You don't believe what you believe. So, I can't yeah. imagine what this story is like. Elemental. Now, where did the yeah. title come from? Well, the elemental comes from the part that um, it's who part of who she is, part of her power, and part of her identity is that she is actually a witch. And this comes out in the story, a long story. She doesn't believe it. I mean, as the reader, you know it as you read. You suspect, you suspect that that's going to happen eventually. But she's denying the fact that this is real. Because, I mean, first of all, she really just wants to be normal. She lives in a town where it's really hard to fit in. And she just wants to be normal. She doesn't want anything to do with that stuff. And so Elemental is basically talking about elemental witches. So witches that have powers over certain elements. And hers is Earth. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Well, witches are very popular these days. In the, yeah, they have so become popular. So your book is going to fit in a lot of different places. <laughs> it'll appeal to people who want to read about witches, and it'll appeal to uh, people who are minorities. And uh, let's mm -hmm. face it, most of us are minorities, minorities yes. of some sort. Either mm -hmm. we're women, or we're black, or we're white, or we're multicolored. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it's in true. Canada, though, I've been in Canada a lot of times, and it seems as if the prejudices are more directed towards the native people. Yeah, yeah. They're and that's one of the reasons I wanted to include it. Yeah, it's true, you know, and it's sad to see. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to include, I mean, I know that she's not Native Canadian, but I wanted to include Native culture in my book because I feel like that's missing so much from everything today. I mean, we see all of these shows and these these movies and everything, and they're talking about how multicultural everything is, but there are no Native people. And I'm thinking, how can you say that you're representing everybody if they're missing? And so to me, that's always bothered me growing up, seeing that they're not represented at all. Like, they're invisible. And we do call them, like, you know, that's what people say here in Canada, that they're the invisible people. Like, people, we act like they don't exist, or we don't acknowledge that they do, so. But it's the same the world over. It doesn't matter where you go, it's the indigenous population that, that receives the prejudice. Like, for example, yeah. in, in Australia, it's the aborigines. And mm -hmm. in Alaska, it's the intuits. And yeah. it's, uh, and here in, in the United States where I am, it could be the Indians. Although we like to think that we're not, We've gotten past all of that. Oh, well, so do we. We're not at all anymore. Yeah, so do we, but it's um, yeah, so do we, but it still happens. I've seen for a sure. tremendous change though in my lifetime compared to when mm -hmm. I grew up. Um, and this is maybe off the subject, but it might be interesting to you. And uh, I was probably well into. Uh, high school, even college age, before I ever even met a black person. I knew mm. they existed, but 
this was very strange to me, and I, yeah. I, didn't, I wasn't prejudiced against them because my parents were like your parents, very strong Christians, and so they never said anything against other races or other types of people when I was young, so I didn't know any different. Um, and so I think that was an advantage to me when I grew up and then had to uh, relate to not only black people, but, uh, but all kinds of minority groups and all kinds of people. Um, mm -hmm. But in my lifetime, I have seen everything. You know, I've, I've lived through the changes, all the changes. Yeah. Uh, from when the first time I traveled in the South, when I was much, much younger, and there was the white toilets and the black toilets out in the back. Oh, wow. And yeah. I the back, and I thought, oh, I know. That's terrible. Yeah. And that's all gone now, and I, I've mm -hmm. lived through the riots, and I've lived through the integration problems, and now we have a black president, which is... I uh, isn't it amazing? It's a lifetime there's been that much of a change. Well, yeah. anyway, I've gotten off your subject. <laughs> tell me, tell our viewers anything more that you'd like to say, because you have such a unique background. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things, too, that I would like to mention, um, as far as Elemental is concerned, um, I don't want people to think that it's a black book. And I think that's what's been happening so far, because there's a black girl on the cover. People assume that it's a black book. Um, I, when I uploaded it on Amazon, which was in July, I noticed right off the bat, after a few weeks, that it kept getting categorized, not by me, by someone, as urban fiction which it's not urban fiction. And so, you know, urban fiction is basically this, I guess, this title that they come up with for black fiction in a city or street lit. They have different names for it, but yeah. So if you look up street lit or urban fiction, this is what it's comes up at. So you'll see a lot of books with... So people that buy it thinking it's that, are they disappointed? Um, I mean, it's very clear that it's not that, so I haven't had any complaints. I did have one reviewer say that some things to her didn't make sense, and I think it's because it was so unnatural. There are unnatural, unnatural events happening in the book, and to her, it's probably like, are you kidding me? What is this? But um, she also did say that the book was relatable, and then she recommended it, so I think that she was just maybe confused. She wasn't expecting it to be what it was, um, but I don't have that problem anymore. Can you do anything different with your cover? Um, I could, yeah, I could, but I don't think that I really want to remove her. Yeah, I mean, I've done, with the title of the book on Amazon, I do say that it is a witch series. I say it's an urban fantasy witch series. So you know what's about witches. And I explain, there's a blurb, it says exactly what it's about. There's a trailer that I have on my website and also on Amazon. So people know, I think, they pretty much know what the book is about by now. I think it's just that when it first came out for the first few weeks, because there aren't a lot of young adult urban fantasy books with black people on the cover, people just automatically assumed it was Streetland. Do you but have, I think have a black person on the cover? I don't think I need to, but I think I want to because there's such it's lacking, you know. Well, then and I think I want to show. Your niche. Yeah, you might as well exactly. face it. This yeah. is your niche. You <laughs> relax and enjoy it. Maybe you'll make a mm -hmm. million. Maybe I will. <laughs> but yeah, and the, the girls in the next books to come, they're not black though, and so I think that once people see that, it'll things will start to change. So. Yeah. Um, because there's different girls from every different walk of life, and so, and that was one of the things I wanted to include because in my life, my friends, um, the people that I interact with on a daily basis, my neighbors, my kids' teachers, my the kids' friends, we're from so many different backgrounds, and I think that um, we, when we live in these small towns, because even like you were saying how you didn't realize that there were black people, well, you knew that they were there, but you'd never met any. For me, believe it or not, it was the same way, because I was born in Canada, and I was born in rural country in Canada, and so the only black people I ever saw were my parents and my brother and sister. And when we went to Guyana when I was six, that was the first time I saw so many black people at once, and I don't remember this, but my dad said, that we got off the plane, and I said, look at all the black people, and I was so excited, and just, yeah, I couldn't believe amazing. it. Well, yeah, once, so. <laughs> I went to Africa once, not for a long time, just for three weeks, but I was in a country that was entirely black. So mm -hmm. I had the, the experience of saying, well, this is how 
black people feel in America sometimes because yeah. Yeah. You, you get up and you're you're the one that's different. You're, you're the one. Yeah. It was a wonderful experience, and the, and the people were so loving and so smart. I just enjoyed it thoroughly. But just that first visual thing you see. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm right now. I'm editing a book that I, I'm going to be publishing. I hope in time for Christmas. That has a white man and a black woman. There's a lot of other experiences that takes place in Africa, but he falls in love with her. And I was trying to help our designer with the cover. And I looked in all of the online. Uh, places that sell that license pictures, you know, for the cover. Mm -hmm. I was looking for a cover with a white man and a black woman. And you couldn't find it? I, you know, I went under interracial couple, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, but they're all black men with white women. White women, yeah. No, I, it's really difficult to find. Yeah, it does. Because even with me, like, as a self-published author, I was trying to find, because um, they have these people who make, self, like, already made covers that you can buy for about $30 and use it for your book. And so I was like, okay, maybe I'll do that instead of trying to do the cover myself. And I looked everywhere, and no one had covers with black people on it. And so I couldn't find a ready-made cover with a black person on it. They wanted you to pay more. And so I said, you know what, I'm just going to try and do this myself. So in the end, I ended up designing my own cover, which took weeks, but I was really happy with the outcome. So, yeah. yeah. I do I do the same thing too. I, I bought a bought software that where I could blend the pictures and you know, mm -hmm. if I find a picture of a black woman I like I can cut that one out and put it with a different white man or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, sometimes you just have to do it yourself. Besides I like sometimes it. Sometimes you do. <laughs> I think so we're what, what now for, to where do we can something. get your book. Um, my book is available on KoboBooks.com. It's also available on Amazon. Kobo Books, that's K-O-B-O Books.com. Okay, nice. So it's for basically the Kobo reader. Um, so I actually just uploaded it on Kobo Books two days ago. So it's just available there as of two days ago. And it has been on Amazon since July 18th. So it's also available there. And it will be available in print in a few weeks. So but right now it's only available as an ebook. It's just an ebook now. Okay, yes. great. That's wonderful. You don't have a picture of your cover, and they you can I show us. <laughs> um, I do have a picture of my cover, but I don't know how I'm going to show you on here. Um, like <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a picture that's like printed out. I have an ebook picture, so. Okay. Well, yeah. we'll have to look it up for ourselves. It's been great talking <laughs> with you, Kelby, and thank you so much for being on our show. And thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful talking to you as well. Oh, thank you. Stay in touch. Send me an email, and we'll uh, talk to each other just for fun someday. Goodbye. Definitely. Take care.